I'm going to record on that device and I'm going to hit record on this device uh, if I can find the record button there she is Bing. recording in progress there we all go everybody we're recorded now and just mute There we go. All right, welcome everyone. Let's start with a short prayer time in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this great gift of living in your most holy and divine will. Lord Jesus, we give you the little pebble of our will in exchange for the gift of living in your most holy and divine will. We fuse ourselves into your will, Lord Jesus. We fuse into your will every thought, word and breath, every heartbeat, all of our memories, our intellect, our will, our anxieties, fears, worries, our fears, our dreams, our hopes, all our love and joy. Everything of this day we place in your will. We abandon ourselves to your will and we make an act of resignation to your will. Dearest Mother Mary, we invite you to come into our hearts and pass through our hearts in all of your power. If you just take a moment of silence, just inviting Our Lady to pass through our hearts and to bring into our hearts the flame of love of her Immaculate Heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your peace, which is deep in our soul. I pray you increase your peace in our lives, Lord Jesus. Increase your peace in our soul, so we can truly be a people of peace. Our Lady, of, uh, Our Lady Queen of the Divine Will, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Servant of God, Louisa Picoretta. Pray for us. Saint Hannibal the Fancier, pray for us. And we just say together, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, before I begin my teaching tonight, which is all ready and set out and should keep you occupied until midnight at the very least, um, does anybody have any questions or queries on the previous weeks that they would like any clarification on? Because I know that it can be hard to bring up a question there and then. If there's anything anyone wants to chip in with, and I know that's unexpected because I normally just motor on in, but um, this week you've all got an opportunity to... Hmm. I have. Um, well done, Caroline. Super. I was, I was just thinking about it while you, before you said this. Um, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to, but when you've been asking about quiet and solitude, mm -hmm. and you were talking about that, so I have been doing that, and I naturally want to do that, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just having, I'm just resting and having a 
conversation with God. And is there a, I know there's Black Show to be in it, but I don't really know much about all that sort of stuff. So is there somewhere you can go for what you, like a simple meditation type of idea of what you're supposed to do? Because if I've tried, I've got this book of prayer, like a um, med, mental prayer, mm-hmm. and it's so by by um, Lahodi, and it's so so in depth. I'm lost by it. I have mm-hmm. no idea what they're talking about. So, okay. I wondered, is there a, I'm just sitting there without in adoration and letting God talk to me, and um, I go on a Saturday, and then I'm just sitting there of an evening. But what, what am I supposed to be doing? Very good. What am I supposed to be doing when I go silent? Um, really good question. We've kind of looked at this a few times in the past, but I don't think you can actually look at it too much because the different things that can happen when you are silent are incredibly varied. So your first thing is when you go into silent prayer is to go in with something because as soon as you practice external silence which is the first step so this is external silence and the moment you do that you confront the noise within your own mind so there's office there's often an explosion of noise within because you suddenly become aware of not just your own thoughts but you also become aware of all your fears, your worries, your anxieties, and all the negatives will come to the surface very, very quickly. Um, so it's really important to go in with a weapon. Um, and the weapon would be the Word of God. So a simple scripture, a psalm, something that you can repeat, especially at the start, something that you can repeat that's not going to leave you too quickly bored. So if you go in, we say, um, I've got Ezekiel 47 open. Let me just choose a random sentence, okay? Wherever the river goes, every living creature which swarms will live. So if I was to keep repeating that, within a space of two minutes, I've repeated it probably 30 times. <laughs> So you need something a bit more meaty, a bit lengthier. So grab hold of a psalm or grab hold of a paragraph, a parable maybe from the New Testament. Something that's going to keep your mind occupied. And then as you're repeating it, you're you're listening to God speaking because this is God's word. So you're listening to God speaking to you and so there's a communication going on two-way communication you're speaking the psalm out to God within your heart and God himself is speaking into your heart about the psalm or the parable now that's your starting point okay that's your starting point what's meant to eventually happen is that meditation itself becomes quieter and quieter so you need less and less. So it goes from a whole parable, a whole psalm, to maybe one sentence and maybe even just one word. And what's happening is, as you spend more time in silence, now not, I, don't, I don't mean more time in terms of you begin with an hour, then you go to two, then you go to three. I mean as in terms of you began, let's say you began praying silently, say a month ago, And as you get into your one month, your two months, your three months, your four months, you'll start to find that there's a, there's a distinctive difference going on in your soul. And you'll start to find the soul is quietening and is more peaceful. And what happens then is when you start to pray in silence, you'll actually start to find that you're losing control of the prayer because the essence of silent contemplation is that it is supernatural. It's not, it's not natural. And therefore, whatever you would use to help you to pray 
is no longer required. I think I'm there already. I know that sounds. I think many people on. are. Um, I did. I mean, I, I I started off. I've been doing. I've been doing um, meditation for. I did the. I did the meditation where you were quiet and mm. let the thoughts go past for years, and then I realised that's not what I'm looking for. But now I can just sit and I, and have a conversation with God. And then once I've done that, I just sit quietly and I can feel him when I go to adoration. I can feel him um, doing something to my heart. And... Okay, but let me pause you there, Caroline. Because um, when we say we can feel him, okay, can everybody who feels God give me a hands up? <laughs> just do this if you feel the presence of God when you pray okay we've got a couple okay sometimes thank you sometimes is fine okay mine sometimes as well okay now this is a this is something very very important that I want you to take a hold of okay what you feel at the moment as the presence of God generally is not. Okay, that's really, really important because God will come to you as much as nice feelings as he will in darkness and in the desert and in suffering. And what many people, the mistake that many, many people make is that when they're sitting in a nice feeling, um, they take that as being God. But then when the nice feeling goes and they're left with a crown of thorns, suddenly God has deserted them. But God is even more present in the sufferings of the passion than he is in the nice feeling on Mount Tabor. Okay, I get it. Yeah, so when we're describing God's activity, you know, it's very important to be careful about the use of the word feeling. And um, it's good to talk about the feelings, but it's very important to be careful about it because your prayer in desolation, your prayer in suffering is often more powerful than your prayer in consolation or in right. nice feelings okay now any any other questions on the on the on the board before i crack on with what i'm going to be doing tonight hi maria hiya good to see you um i don't think i've got your recording from last time oh okay so um what i'm trying to do is put the recordings onto youtube rather than dropbox to make them more easy to access and um, this week I've been largely bedridden with a virus, so I haven't been able to put any recordings onto Dropbox or YouTube. And coupled with that, I've been, just as the my virus cleared up on Thursday, um, I was giving a retreat day at a um, Carmelite monastery down in Aylesford. So I haven't been able to do it this week, but I'm hoping that Monday, Tuesday, I'll get everything up there, okay? No, no worries, thanks. Cool, right, we'll crack on then. So I'm looking at Ezekiel 47, um, which you all have, is a familiar scripture, I'm sure, but I'm going to go through it. So this is the prophet Ezekiel, and he is being given a guided tour of Jerusalem by an angel. Um, if you've never had one of those guided tours, I recommend you sign up for them as soon as possible. Then the angel brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the right side of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate, and led me round on the outside to the outer gate, 
that faces toward the east and the water was coming out on the right side. Going eastward the, with the line in his hand the man measured a thousand cubits and led me through the water it was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water it was up to the waist. Again he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass for the water had risen it was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed and he said to me son of man do you see this then he led me back along the bank of the river as i went back i saw upon the bank of the river many trees on one side and on the other and he said to me this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Araba, where it enters the stagnant waters of the sea. The water will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, every living creature which swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Skip out a couple of verses. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of fruit tr trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. Okay. So the angel leads the prophet on a journey. The journey is in a river, and we're all in that river, the river of the Holy Spirit. And the river has different depths to it. There's ankle, knee, and waist deep water. Now you can say that these are the stages of the spiritual life. The ankle deep water is where you're just on your beginning journey you're just starting out and we are like children playing in shallow waves okay that's the ankle deep water playing in the shallow waves then we start to get more serious about our interior journey and we go away from the playtime and we go into deeper water which is knee deep the distance measured, a thousand cubits, is an indication of the journey that has to be made between each stage. There's still nothing happening though. Knee deep water isn't producing anything significant. The angel then leads him further to waist deep water. And once again there's no song or dance, it's simply a thousand cubits measured of, the water is... Um, ankle knee waist deep okay it's not until the prophet gets into this water here we go he measured a thousand and it was a river that i could not pass through for the water had risen it was deep enough to swim in so the water now is too deep for walking the water now is only suitable for swimming in and if anybody knows about swimming you'll know you have to abandon yourself to the water. You cannot swim with your feet on the bottom. You have to abandon yourself to the water. And it's only when this abandonment to the water takes place, the deep, deep water that is when the fruit trees are there the trees that bear fruit it's only in that deep prayer where the soul is completely abandoned to god that the fruit can produce be produced and the soul can finally live fully the christian life that it is called to live Wherever the river goes, 
there will be very many fish, okay, wherever the river goes. So when you're abandoned to the Holy Spirit, wherever the Holy Spirit flows and takes you, there is always going to be souls to be brought into the kingdom. And this is why I keep emphasizing this necessity to plunge deeper into the Christian life of contemplation because it's only when the soul has been purified and when the soul gets to this to the fifth mansion for example I have the fifth mansion here if I just remind you of one of the things that's said about the fifth dwelling place to which you are all called you are all called to this and if I get to the start of it the purpose of the prayer of union which takes place in the fifth mansion is for the strengthening of love for the birth of good works that the Lord desires so that's the entire purpose so we should all be praying for this because when you read the history of the church the lives of the saints they were clearly in this fifth mansion because of the way that they lived their lives like St. Philip Neri for example who could raise the dead and who would convert the sinners with ease that only happens to a soul that has attained to this type of prayer and this is what my belief is this is the Lord is wanting to give us this grace of the fifth mansion sixth mansion seventh mansion and beatitude so we need to be aware of what God wants to give us so that we can be disposed towards what he wants to give us we need to be ready to receive it let me just take my notebook I don't want to wrap it on too much because I'm always aware I really do go on and I've got things that I need to be bringing out. Uh -huh. Right, page 204 and 205 of the Interior Castle book. So what I'm going to describe to you here is some part of your destiny, okay? This is the seventh mansion. This is mystical marriage. You are all, this is your vocation, all of you, okay? All of you. Now, I want you to think in terms of marriage. Um, uh, your, your, your bridegroom is, is Christ, okay? So let's put it into context of a human relationship. Um, he finds you attractive. Uh, it's mainly women on today, so I'm going to use feminine language. <laughs> but he finds us attractive. He wants to date us. He speaks to us using his word, using the methodology of Lectio Divina. He's speaking to us. He's inviting us into a friendship, a relationship. And he wants to spend more time with us. So we cooperate. We spend more time with him. And instead of us just doing all the talking, part of the relationship is spent listening to him which as we all know can be really awkward because we sometimes think well what's he going to say to me and how is he going to speak to me so we need to attune our ears to the bridegroom's voice which involves silence lectio and maybe some spiritual direction how is jesus speaking to me what's he calling me to be like what's he calling me to do and then that develops and eventually what happens is the bridegroom really likes his dates with us, wants a little bit more intimacy, and eventually invites us to get married. So there's a betrothal takes place. That's kind of like fifth, sixth mansions. And this is where the bridegroom now is preparing us for marriage. So he wants to give us the grace of, of mystical marriage. That's what he wants to bestow on the soul. And he is going to prepare the soul for marriage. 
Okay, he will do it, but he needs your cooperation. For example, when he offers the engagement, it's always good to say yes. <laughs> People do say no for their various reasons when it comes to engagement, but when Christ asks to marry you, it's good to say yes, and then to let the ring go on the finger and start preparing for the marriage. So the marriage is is like this. This is this is one of the statements with regards to mystical marriage when you're going to get married to Christ. In these dwellings, your soul is divinized. I want to hang on to that. Your soul is divinized. Okay? This is going to happen to every single one of you in the near future. Because the church that we're going to be in in the near future is going to be completely divinized. So everybody who calls themselves a Catholic in the not too distant future will be divinized. Okay? The soul is divinized and becomes like God through likeness and participation in God. Your faculties and your actions become divine-like and are centered in God. God and the person move together simultaneously as one. The seventh dwelling places have continual thrusts and impelling energies of love from God that are like love letters from the Lord. These bring the joyful realization that God desires that the soul remain with him forever. All slavish fear is gone, as is any fear about evil, the devil, hell or death. So all the fears have gone. Nothing disturbs the soul's peace. There are none of the movements or shocks that take place in the senses, faculties and imagination of other dwelling places. In this experience the soul sees with spiritual understanding that there is someone in the interior depths who sends life-giving water to the faculties and senses. The soul experiences deep peace and repose in these dwellings. The soul has seen so much and been through so much that nothing frightens it anymore and it enjoys the company of God and does not experience a, so a, a lonely solitude anymore. Okay, so this is where the soul is in mystical marriage, which is God's will for all of us. Very important to get that. This is God's will for all of us to attain to. In this life. This is 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion, and you may become partakers of the divine nature. In other words, divinized. Our first Pope was telling us that we can be divinized through his divine power. That's what he's saying to us. So it's Christ's power which will divinize us. That power is made manifest through our prayer time and through the sacraments. But it's very important to get this idea that Christ wants to divinize us. It's really important to get that principle because if, if we don't realize what Christ wants to do in us, 
we're only ever going to play in the shallows of our faith. We need to be prepared to go so much deeper. The deep waters of the divine will. The deep waters of contemplation. This is what Christ is calling us to. I'm now opening up on Isaiah chapter 30. This is verse 20. Though the water gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself any more, but your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, then you will defile your silver-covered graven images and your gold-plated images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, be gone. So Christ is giving us a clear direction, a clear path to walk on, very clear. And he's saying, this is the way I want you to walk walk in it and is cautioning us against being distracted by the trappings of this world there are certain things in life that we need but he's also cautioning us against being being too too attached so it's one thing having stuff it's another thing those things having us But also, it's, it's the fact that Christ is the teacher of the way you're walking on. So although I'm here giving you the instruction for your interiority and for your journey in the divine will, ultimately Christ is the one who is teaching you. He is the one guiding your heart. Okay? Before I go on to the divine will writings, which I'm going to do next, are there any questions that anybody wants to ask at this point or anything that you want to bring up or and require clarification on? <coughs> Excuse me. No, excellent. So this is um this is from Louisa. This is Father Joseph's book, page 325. This is Louisa, volume 11, April the 14th, 1912. Now, I'm slightly repeating myself from previous sessions, um, but I, want, I think it's very important that we, we repeat some lessons in order to understand the lessons, okay? And I wanted to really focus on divinization in this session, which is the deep waters of Ezekiel. And I want you to really get the get get grasp that this is for you. Alright? People often will exclude themselves when it comes to such a high calling. But you are in an era of the church when Christ is going to bestow the graces for divinization upon the church. And he has placed you in the church and he has placed you in this group and you have responded to this call. So my word to you would be to be courageous in anticipating the graces that Christ wants to give you. Don't place your state of life or your circumstances in life or your situation in life, what Pope Benedict called the sits in Leben, the situation in life. You mustn't use these things as an obstacle because these things, everything in your life can help you to be divinized not hinder the only thing that hinders us in our pro in this process is what's going on in our own mind 
I'm not worthy. I'm not capable. I can't do this. Anita, you're stopping me in mid-sentence. Honestly, it's outrageous. Go on. Uh, yes, because I want you to repeat that last bit because your, your quality is not very good again. You're okay. Um, so whatever your situation in life um, works for you. In your process, in the process of divinization, it is not hindering you. Can you improve the quality a bit? It's not good. It's been bad for the whole session. Anita, I think it's the internet. You to your your it's you're not coming out uh, um, across, Claire. Go away. What's that? <laughs> I think it's our area that is poor at the moment. Okay. Do you, Nina, uh, Joanna, can you hear me? Okay. There you go. Look, look. If they can hear me, okay, in America. So come on. <laughs> Fine. There we go. Thanks, Francis. Okay, Nita, I'm sorry. It'll have to be a local problem rather than my problem because right. I know that... So you sound a bit better then. Can you just repeat the last couple of minutes? Okay, sure. So... Also tell me, also tell me the volume 11, what the date was. Okay, okay sure. Uh, volume 11, April the 14th, 1912. And the... Um, if in this era of the church Christ is giving us these extraordinary new graces to divinize us he has placed us in the church in this era he has placed us in this group in this era he has called you to live in his will way ahead of the rest of the, of the world's population and therefore rather than think that this is not something you can do it's worth realizing that this is something Christ is doing in you and any perceived weaknesses do not count against you. Christ has chosen you because of your weaknesses. So this is really important because we have to have a changed attitude towards our interior life in terms of there is no limit to what Christ can do in us. We stop limiting Christ in his work. And one of our battles will be against self-pity, false humility, pride. These will be our major battles. Self-pity is a real kicker. It's really sometimes hard not to fall into self-pity and thus to fall back in our spiritual progress. It's really, really hard to realise in the depths of our being that our journey is governed by grace, not by us. That's a real challenge. So the, the, the obstacles in your spiritual journey are not your weaknesses. Your weaknesses are fine. Um, your doubts are fine. Your question marks over your character are fine. Your, character, your question marks over your, your virtues are fine. Don't worry about this. So long as you're going to regular confession, receiving the Eucharist, you're fine. Your biggest hassles are pride, ego, and you thinking you can do this. When it's Christ who's doing it in you. Christ is doing it in you. The golden rule. This is Christ's work. Okay? If you want something to meditate on, meditate on that. Really take a hold of it. This is Christ's work. Okay? And I'm going to go on about that. I'm going to go on about Louisa for a minute now. Um, Louisa, 
When I was on earth, did my hands not lower themselves to work the wood, hammer the nails and help my father Joseph? While I was doing this with my own hands and fingers, I created souls, called others back to life, I divinized and sanctified all human activity, imparting divine merit to each human action. Okay. Now I want to connect that to Mansion 7. Mansion 7 used to be the absolute height of holiness attained by the saints on earth and it was only seen as for the monasteries and the convents for those living an enclosed life. St Francis de Sales said no this holiness can be for everybody. So he was one of the first to make that distinction. This is for everybody, not a distinction, sorry, to bring it together. But now in this age that you're in now, so in previous eras, the divinization of the human action was for the seventh mansion. Now, the divinization of the human action is for everybody who has the gift of living in the divine will. So you're immediately placed, if you're in a state of grace, you've been to confession and communion, you're immediately able to do divine actions. It's, it's straight away. Christ can place you in that immediately. And it doesn't depend on feelings. Please really highlight that. My actions are divine whether it feels like it or not. My actions are divine. Now go back to Isaiah with um, the, the prophet Isaiah um, saying your teacher will see you and he will say this is the way walk in it okay so now i'm reading to you the words of christ from the divine world diaries and he's telling you he has divinized your human actions he has done it okay from gerard what is the difference between mystical marriage and beatitude let's come back to that in a bit gerard um let me what i might do it's a really good question, Gerard. I appreciate you asking that question, actually. Um, let me finish off this session on, div on divinization, because I've got one or two more things to read. Maybe I can develop a session on Beatitude for the coming weeks. Um, Louisa hasn't written much on the state of Beatitude. Um, hmm... I think it could be really important to cover that actually because um that's the vision that's the that's the peak so maybe i'll see if i can put something together next week on beatitude while on earth beatitude on earth what is beatitude about when you're on earth okay so i'll okay, stick to divinization for now and then i think i'll i need to build up quite a bit on what beatitude is good question so jesus divinizes every act now this is what he says on in volume 3 january the 12th 1900 i could have done the work of redemption in very little time and with one single word okay i could have done redemption with one word but he chose to do a process now think about the fact that in the early church, people were being divinized in a process. Now you're in the end times, your actions can be divinized instantly. So think about the changing dynamic. I wanted to apply myself to many different actions so that man might be completely renewed and divinized even in the most menial tasks. Okay, It's in the menial tasks that your actions are being divinized. So once again, we mustn't think in terms of the only way my acts are being divinized 
is when I'm doing important things. It's not. You are being divinized if you're pushing a piece of pen across a paper, like some of you might be doing now. If you're wiping your glasses, if you're making a cup of tea, if you're getting dressed, putting on your socks, the most menial tasks. Because Christ doesn't want us reaching up, he wants us humbling ourselves and reaching down. Because he says um, that he came down so that we do not have to reach up. He came down. Just want to do a couple more references from Louisa. So, this is a Louisa volume 19, July the 29th, 1926. Our nature is formed of the most pure and most simple communicating love. And the nature of true love possesses the following trait. It produces from itself images fully similar to itself in power, in goodness, in beauty and in everything it contains. So Christ produces from within himself us and we are meant to be similar to him in power, in goodness, in beauty and in everything Christ contains. The nature of true love has this prerogative of producing images fully similar to itself of assuming the image of the beloved. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> so the second person of the Trinity, in order to redeem mankind, assumed the nature and image of man and communicated his divinity to him. So Christ... At this moment in time, right now, in this teaching, he is communicating his divinity to you. How do I know this? Because I'm giving you a catechesis on the divine will. Catechesis comes from the Greek word, which means oral instruction. And what we have got in our Western society, oh, excuse me, I just need a sip. Um, we have um, a focus on intellectual knowledge. So if you want to get a qualification, we gain the intellectual knowledge for that qualification. That becomes a bit of a focus. But actually, um, in the sacred scripture, the oral instruction that was given to the, by the early church was not about intellectual knowledge. It was about a personal encounter with the living God. So, when Peter was set on fire with the Holy Spirit in, in Acts chapter 2, a few chapters later, he goes to Cornelius' house, and he's preaching the gospel, and as he does so, the Holy Spirit falls down upon the members of Cornelius' house, and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, and start prophesying and praying in tongues. This is called pedagogy, where the visitation of God is aligned with the proclamation of the word. Which means that I can confidently say now that as I'm teaching you about Christ's desire to divinize you, Christ can infuse into you the appropriate graces for you to be divinized. So you all have within your soul right now the seed of divinization because Christ has planted it in you through his word he's planted that seed in you I hope that makes sense Huh. 
Oh, here we go. This is one of the ways in which Jesus communicates himself to the soul. Okay, I wasn't going to talk about this, but like, uh, it's here, so I may as well use it. This is one of the ways Jesus communicates to the soul. The third way in which Jesus speaks to me is when in speaking, he communicates his very substance to the soul. It seems to me that just as when the Lord created the world, at one word things were created, in the same way, since his word is creative, in the very act in which he pronounces the word, he creates in the soul the very thing that he is saying. But then you might say, but Derek, it's not Jesus who is speaking, it's you. <laughs> yes. But I'm an evangelist, and there's only one evangelist in the church, and that's Christ. And therefore I'm operating in union with Christ in my work of evangelization. And I know that when we preach his word, when we teach his word, he is the one doing the teaching, not me. That's why I pray beforehand. Lord, what do you want to say? I never say what I want to say. Oh, it's okay, Jesus. What do you want to teach the group tonight? And the teaching is based upon what he wants to teach. So here, Louisa is saying, his word is creative, and the very act in which he pronounces the word, and he wants to divinize you, therefore he creates in the soul the very thing he is saying. He creates in your soul, tonight, the seed of divinization. Which, which will eventually produce the fullness of fruit in completely divinizing you, making your soul light, just as God is light. Six one five. Right. Okay. Louisa, volume 28, March the 9th, 1930. My daughter, the truths pertaining to my divine will are the pathways that will lead souls into the arms of the light of my divine fiat. These truths constitute the seeds, and the seeds beget in the creature the beginning of the life of my divine will. Each one of these truths are like many infusions of life that develop my divine life into the soul. This is why I've told you so many things about my divine fiat. Each truth will bring to some souls the seed, to others the begetting of life, to others nourishment, or the breath, or the air, or the light, or the heat. Each truth contains one more degree of growth. Okay, so you've had tonight an hour of teaching on the divine will, with multiple truths on the divine will. Every truth produces something new in your soul. Now, when we are, as we are now, we are very unaware of what's going on in our soul. Very unaware. We're very aware of our physical surroundings, but our soul is a mystery. And in the prophet Isaiah, Jesus says, I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. So Jesus' teaching on the divine will is leading you along a pathway which for you is a little bit dark and a little bit silent. You're a little bit deaf and a little bit blind. 
And what's guiding you along the pathway of the divine will is Christ's word. And it's true what the Bible says, his word is a light unto my path. Now it's not a physical path, it's a spiritual path. The path is the pathway in to the soul. And it's his word which guides us. So I've told you tonight that the truths on the divine will are seeds planted in the soul that produce fruit in accordance with the prophet Ezekiel. This is the divine will is that deep, deep river which produces trees producing fruit. So all you have to do is just obey the teaching that Christ is giving you. Have the times of prayer. Do your menial acts in the divine will. This is so important with the menial acts. Combing your hair, having a shower, getting ready for bed, making a meal, cup of tea, sitting down and being with somebody, listening to somebody. All these tiny, tiny acts are your means of divinization. You might not feel a thing, but you're being divinized all the time. Okay, it's 2059. Any questions or any thoughts or anything you want to discuss? What does divinized mean? I knew somebody would ask that question. <laughs> In a nutshell, it's the complete transformation of the soul into the image and likeness of God. So when we sin, when we fall into original sin, or when we fall into sin, um, the, the, it said that the soul is in the image and likeness of God, but because of sin, that image has been distorted. So now we have to be repurified, cleansed and healed, etc. And the soul has to be, as it were, remade in God's image and likeness, which is the process of divinization. So we will look like God. But that, that, that likeness is hidden from but it's failed under this body so on the surface we look ordinary but underneath if people could see our soul when we're divinized they would see light because god is light in other words we're going to be like uh, adam when he was created basically yes yeah thank you felicita super Just sitting and waiting to see if there's any more questions or anything anybody wants to bring up. No? Great. That's a nice easy evening for me then. Just a mere 50 minutes. So what I want to do is I'd like to finish with a little bit of a prayer time if we may and i want to do this see, see how this works on zoom um when i'm out and about giving retreats and stuff this is the kind of way i would normally pray with a group after i've done a teaching and it's just literally praying into any blockages to what god wants to do or what god is doing so i do it it's it's done largely with you guys being in silence and um, what I'll do is I'll just um, listen and then I'll, I'll pray against anything that I think is blocking the divine will in your life um, or whatever the Lord wants me to pray about. So we'll just have a moment of silence and we'll evoke the Holy Spirit and we'll see what the Lord wants to do here. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, be poured out afresh upon all who are watching and listening. Jesus, you want to minister, so I'm going to minister with you, Lord Jesus. Come, divine will, come pray in my praying. going to hold up a cross because all healing comes from the cross
Heavenly Father, I just thank you for everyone who has come here tonight. And right from the outset, I just declare peace over everybody's heart. Peace in the name of Jesus and by the power of his divine will. Just pray peace at the very core of your being. The peace of Christ at the core of your being. So all in your being becomes still and peaceful. Everything is calmed. Peace. And in the name of Jesus, and by the power of his divine will, I pray against all fear. I pray for all fears to melt, especially any fears caused by a poor father figure or a poor mother figure in our lives, or a lack of a father figure, or a lack of a mother figure. We just pray against those fears in the name of Jesus, that the Lord will melt them away. Come Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray against any money worries, any financial worries. We pray for an increase in trust so that we can completely trust in Jesus. In this moment, here and now, all will be well. And I just pray for all financial fears to melt like the mist. Just to melt away. And the Lord increase your trust in him. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus and by the power of his divine will, I pray against any wounds caused by our mothers or fathers. And we ask Our Lady to stretch her hand out and to touch our hearts, to heal any wounds that were either wittingly or unwittingly visited upon us by our parents. So that those wounds can be healed and peace may flow. Dearest Mother, may the flame of love of your immaculate heart be poured into any wounds to do with our mother or father and bring healing. Once again I speak peace over you all. Peace to your hearts and minds. Peace to your families. Peace to your children. Peace in the name of Jesus. Just pray against any obstacles in your interior journey, any wall, any barrier that you feel may be there preventing you from journeying inwards. And I ask the door just to place before you, I ask the Lord to place before you an open door that you can step into the open door. And if that door has appeared in your imagination, just go through it right now. Go through it in your imagination right now. I feel that some of you are being invited to go from the third to the fourth mansion right now. 
and some from the fourth to the fifth. And the Lord's just opening the door up and just saying, come on through. Come on through. And on the other side of that door, it's beautiful. It's white and light. And the Lord is preparing you for new riches in your journey. So we thank the Lord for the miracle of grace and for leading us through the barrier. Through the barrier. The barrier is now gone. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I now have an image for you, which I think is associated with the threshold you just stepped over, of Our Lady nursing you at the breast. She's giving you the nourishing milk that will help strengthen you in this new season of prayer. Just enjoy the consolation from Our Lady. Just enjoy it. Let it fill you. Be satiated on it. Satiated. Be filled with that goodness that Our Lady is giving you. And it's interesting that the Lord has led me into this prayer for you in the month of the Rosary. So we thank Our Lady for this special month dedicated to her rosary, dedicated to prayer. And that she is going to give you all great, great blessings this month. Great blessings. And I'm going to pray these blessings over you. That Our Lady gives you the healing of your soul that you've longed for for many years. That that blessing will flow this month. That Our Lady will give you a deep, deep peace in your soul this month. A peace that you've never experienced before. I pray for that for you all. I pray for the love of God to permeate your soul in a beautiful, unique way, beginning now that your soul will be refreshed and renewed by God's love poured out in his divine will. And remember, in every act that you do, even now in your breathing, your sitting, your moving, your thinking, every act is an outpouring of God in the divine will. So every act is filled with the love of God. Every single act. So just thank you, Lord, that in every act we do, creation is being filled with love and we are being filled with love. So we thank you, Jesus. And my final prayer for everyone tonight is, Lord, I pray that you will help everybody who is here and everyone who hears this teaching to be divinized fully to be radically transformed by grace I thank you Father that you're going to do this for us no one is excluded no one you are all included whether you feel weak or strong this is for you And I thank you, Father, for divinizing us and leading us daily closer to beatitude on earth. In Jesus' name, Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Recording stopped. Well, thank you, Derek. Thank you, everybody. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Usual thank rules you. apply. If anyone needs any help for myself or Father Dominic, drop us an email. We're here for you all, okay? Thank bless you. you. Have a great you. evening, everyone. God bless you, and thank you for joining me. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Wow. <laughs> Sorry.